Good to see this good number here tonight, many in whom we've seen recently just two or three weeks ago. Calvary Singers and I have been on the road for some time together the last month and a half, and I tell you, it's wonderful to hear him again here tonight. Saw Brother Ron come in, looked like he's been at the beach or in a heated revival meeting somewhere. <laughs> Amen. I saw him. He always kind of grins when he gets here, in the, and, and the atmosphere and the temperature is rising a little bit. I kind of saw his tongue in cheek knowing, well, he'll take that out of us in a little bit. Don't worry about that. But I want you to know, folk, God's been on these grounds the last couple of days for some time. Don't let me just say the last couple of days. Our church has been praying. Our pastor's been preaching. People have been praying. We were blessed yesterday. And I, I, I hate to just preach like here tonight. We have Tanya uh, uh, Sobaliba from the, what used to be the Soviet Union, about 500 kilometers from Moscow. She was my interpreter over there in Siberia in those areas. I was one of the most sought-after evangelists. I tell you, she made my message so complete and perfect. I mean, there were no, no grammatical errors or anything, but now I, I, I said I'm going to have to get her to interpret for me tonight, but I don't think that would work on this bunch here. <laughs> I was a real evangelist over there in Russia. But I tell you, we have the Holy Spirit here to guide us and to lead us and to direct us. And I am convinced with all of my heart, God has every one of us here for a divine purpose. There are no mistakes, no accident or luck in God's economy, and those who speak of accident and luck speak the language of the heathens. And I, I know I'm not speaking among the heathens here tonight. Those who realize God is a sovereign God, and we're here for a purpose. Now, I'm convinced He's more interested in making us holy than he is happy. Of course, if he makes us holy, we'll be happy he made us holy. I, I promise you that. So if you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn with me to the book of Jonah. We're going to read three verses here. Jonah, the first chapter. Jonah 1. Jonah 1, beginning the first verse, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee from the to flee unto Tarsus from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarsus, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. May God use his word to speak to our hearts tonight. I spoke last evening in the conference here on <clears throat> the sovereignty of God and his demands. God's a sovereign God, and he's going to have his way, folk, whether we like it or not. God's going to have his way. I want to talk to you tonight on the subject of the simplicity of God in his direction. And I, I, I want us to just look at this tonight. The Word of God, the Bible says, the Word of the Lord came unto Jonah the prophet, the son of Amittai, saying. Now, you know, when God speaks, friend, his word's not up for discussion or debate. It's up for direction. If God says anything here this week, it'll be for direction. You won't have to debate about it. You won't have to discuss it. It's a matter of fact. That's the way God speaks. As Tanya said yesterday, you don't have to read in between the lines in the Bible. You do other novels and books, but God just says what he wants to say. The Bible's not hard to understand. It's just hard to believe. And, and the problem is, you see, 
Do you, do you reckon God is so theological that the average Christian can't get direction anymore from God? Do you reckon that's, that's the case? Do you reckon that Jonah headed down to Joppa because theologically he misunderstood the Word of God? Reckon he did? I don't believe he did. Let's look and see. As we look at the Word of God tonight, I want you to see, first of all, the certainty of God's Word. For the Bible says, listen to it. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. Came unto Jonah. God's word is the most accurate missile in all the world. He never, he never, he never misses. He always hits his target. And I believe he's got some targets here this week. I don't believe God will miss one of them. Friend, I'm convinced with all of my heart, God never misses his target. And if your pastor is preaching with the anointing of the Spirit of God, friend, I want you to know he'll hit the target. God never misses, and God never minces words. You don't get mad at your pastor every time he rings your bell and the Word of God splits your heart and pricks your heart, do you? You don't run out and slap the mailman every time he brings you a bill, do you? You quit making the bills, God will quit sending the duns. I'm convinced with all of my heart, God is reaching for the target tonight. I don't believe God's going to miss us. God's going to speak to our hearts. And there's nowhere in this world we can hide from a thrice holy God and get away from God's word or dart. You know, the psalmist said it over there uh, in 139th Psalm. This is an awesome psalm, but it's such a truthful psalm. The Bible plainly teaches us in that seventh verse, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there, Shall thy hand, uh, thy hand lead me? Your hand's going to reach me. We can't get away from God, folk. Nowhere can we hide. God's been on these grounds. He'll be peeping through the keyholes. There's an all-seeing eye watching every one of us. And we're not going to get away from the Word of God. We've been praying for every message to be a javelin from the palm of God to speak to every heart in this congregation. Folk, we need to see Jesus. We need to hear from God. Oh, friend, listen to me. It, it, when we think about it, you, you say, Brother Sonny, God doesn't ever speak to me that way, that personal. Well, it's because you're not saved. The Bible says, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. They have to hear direction before they can follow him. Now, friend, I'm talking about God's sheep now. He may not speak to you that personal. But if you know God, I want you to know you can hear him speak. And you can't get away from God speaking. This is the word of God. Oh, you may have forgotten it, but I want you to know God has a way of making us remember it. Amen? <laughs> oh, they follow me. I give unto them eternal life. Yeah, we may forget it, but I want you to know God has a way of making us remember it. You'll at least remember the tune. Hello. I remember... I remember back, <laughs> I heard about a little black boy back there, and uh, they were in school, you know, and, and, and the teacher was asking about their multiplication tables, and, and she, it, was, it was time for a test, and she uh, did it orally. She said, now, who can say their multiplication tables in ones? One of them, I, I can say it, teacher. Jumped up and said, mm -hmm, one time, one is one. Mm -hmm, one time, two is two. Mm, okay, okay, you know him. Sit down, sit down. Well, another one came up and said, come here. He said, come here. Blau Maddox, can you say yours? Yes, I can say mine. You say your two. Mm, two time, one is two. Mm, two time, two is four. Mm, okay, sit down, you know. He said, come over here, Festus. I want you to say it. He got up. Mm, I want you to say your threes. Mm, 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 
I thought you knew your multiplication. Yes, ma'am, I remember the music, but I forgot the words. <laughs> and folks, let me tell you something, folks. I've got news for you. God's got ways of making us remember the words. Amen. God will make us remember the words. I'm convinced with all my heart. Listen. Friend, there have been times, I remember Brother Manley said this so many times, I saw his precious sisters back here tonight. He, he's made this statement over and over. There are times when I thought God spoke to me and God didn't speak. But God has never spoken to me that I didn't know God spoke to me. Now you have to figure that out for yourself. You always had to figure his messages out. But I've got news for you, it's a fact. If God speaks to you, you're going to know God speaks to you. Oh, listen, friend, he, he, how does he speak, Brother Sonny? He tells us there in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto our fathers through the prophets, but hath in these last days spoken unto us through or by his Son. God speaks by his Son through the Spirit. By his Spirit through the Word of God, and the Spirit of God never supersedes this blessed book. That's why there's so much uh, polygotten going on out there today, friend. I want you to know that's not the Word of God. God specifically speaks to His people. Now, we may have a collective revival here this week on these grounds, but if we do, it'll be because God has personally spoke to you in your heart. You must hear Him in a personal way. God have mercy, God doesn't miss. The word of God came unto Jonah. God doesn't miss, does he, folks? Came unto Jonah. Oh, the certainty of God's word. Listen to me. Then we see the clarity of God's word. Verse 2. Look at it. The Bible says, The word of God came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, friend, I want to say something to you. Well, I want all of us just to rise for a few moments. These people come. Would you stand and let these dear people come in? Just rise. Okay, you can sit back down. Now, I want to ask you a question. Did you understand that? Was that so theological you couldn't understand that? Huh? God said, arise, oh, friend, the clarity of God's word. He's talking about an immediate response. Get up, arise, hit the trail. I think we can understand that. That's not so hard to understand. Do you think so? I remember <laughs> Brother Ralph Gossett and I was over there in Dallas. One time I was with him in a meeting. We was riding down the highway listening to Elder McVeigh preach. That was the funniest preacher I ever heard in my life. He was a precious black man. And he was talking about Mary running out to the, uh, where Jesus had been laid in the grave. He said, and Mary jumped up and ran out and looked and peeped in the sepulchre. I knew he meant sepulchre, you know. And, and, and I guess that's the way some people pronounce it. But he was preaching, and we just rolled, almost wrecked the automobile. One day he was preaching on Zacchaeus. And he said, folk, I want to talk to you about a serious message today. There's a man in the Bible called Zacchaeus. He said, and God walked under a sycamine tree. And he looked up and he said, Zacharias, come down. I've got to have a meeting with you today. Now, he said, now listen, folk. He said, this is where most folk miss it. God said, Zacharias, make haste and come down. He said, what do you think that means? He said, you know what the Greek is on that? That means, Zacharias, don't drag around. Get down here. That's what he said. That was his very words. Oh, listen, friend. I'm, I'm convinced when God speaks, oh, the clarity of God's word. I want you to know when, you, you, know, you, know what, you know what the Hebrew is on, arise, don't drag around, get up, he said, immediately God speaking to Jonah. Get up, Jonah. I think you can understand that, don't you? Oh, listen, friend, oh, I do not believe God's word's hard to understand. I'm convinced it's just difficult for us to believe it. That's the biggest problem we're having today. Oh, let's see if you can understand this. I, I, I wonder if we've missed God somewhere. I, I want to see if you can understand this. The Bible says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and lo, I'll be with you always, even 
until the end of the world. Is that hard to understand? You know, I think we're having as big a problem with this thing as Jonah was. It's not misunderstanding the message, folks. I'm convinced with all of my heart. Oh, listen, it's not what, uh, not what, not what we know. People say, you know, there's a lot of things I don't know. That's not what's bothering me, folks. It's what we do know that we don't do that bothers me. That's the problem with our churches today. God have tender mercy. Listen, we see the certainty of God's Word. We see the clarity of God's Word. Then we see the conviction of God's Word. Jonah was convicted immediately when the Word of God hit him. And when the Word of God speaks to you, you'll be convicted. How do you know he was convicted? Because he responded to it. And you can respond two ways. Hello? You can respond two ways. He responded to it, friend. Listen, I want you to know God spoke to him personally. He said, Jonah, arise. He spoke to him geographically. He said, Jonah, go to Nineveh. He spoke to him functionally. He said, cry against that city, he said. God spoke purposely. This city with its wickedness and great sins have come up before me. Oh, listen to me, my dear friend. Oh, would to God. I believe we could have Holy Ghost revival across America if our pulpits would once again become aflamed with the preachers of the living God to preach just what God said. I believe that would be sufficient. God's not so theological we can't understand him, folks. You know, theology is what man says about God. This book, uh, uh, this book is what God says about himself and the Holy Spirit can lead you through it. Listen to me, friend. We need an old-fashioned, God-breathed, heaven-sent, hell-disturbing, devil-driving, Christ-exalting, sin-killing revival in America today. We are in trouble in this nation. I believe the judgment hand of God is over this country of ours. We need revival from the pulpit first, then to the pews. We need a revival. I, you know, I believe this... This monster that's been created in our land is created from past preaching. That's the problem we're set facing. Our problem's not in Washington, folk. Our problem's in the pulpits. Hello. This is where our problem is today. God have tender mercy. Uh, you say, but preacher, we can't preach on, we can't preach like that anymore, preach on sin. You know, it's not popular to preach on sin. That's what I was preaching on last night. You know, they teach us now you got to be positive. You can't be negative. You have to create an atmosphere conducive for sinners to come to your church, or you can't have a mega super church. Hello? My friend, it's hard. It's a difficult thing. But you can never preach a message that God will anoint that makes a service conducive for a sinner to feel comfortable under the preaching of the Word of God. I want you to know God will rip his heart to, ribbon, to ribbons. God will pierce his heart. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And friend, if God speaks, it's going to rip our hearts apart. My God, have mercy, this blessed old book. It's never lost any of its edge. It's never lost its power. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone, to everyone. Everyone that believeth, that is the word of God. Oh, listen, I think about it. I want us to look at something here. You know, if we'd get to preaching the truth at least, my dear friend, we could make this decision. Those who heard it would have to make a decision. And I'm convinced they'd come face to face with truth. Jonah was convicted and he came face to face with making a decision. Let's look at Jonah's decision. What, what decision did he make? Third verse. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. Oh, my God, look at this, folks. Every time we hear the Word of God, God's blessed Word, we make a decision. Every man that will stand in this pulpit, my friend, has made a decision. Every person that hears the Word of God will make a decision. We're all going to make a decision every time we hear the Word of God. As a matter of fact, you say, well, preacher, I'm not going to make a decision. You just decided not to decide. You've already decided. I've got news for you, friend. We're going to make a decision when we hear the Word of God. Are you listening to me? Oh, I get to thinking about it. And I, I get to thinking about, oh, I'm convinced with all my heart, the victories of this conference and your life hinges on the decision of obedience. Obedience is the secret to this blessed book, my friend. Oh, 
Three things we see about Jonah's choice. Look at it. We don't like to face this truth. But the first one is the possibility to disobey. I know, I know some people don't like to face that truth, but I want you to know everybody in this congregation, God has given to you the power to disobey or to obey. Are you listening to me? God didn't make us robots. We got to understand when God speaks, there's only one alternative to obey or disobey. That is the word of God. I believe it teaches it very clearly. Some of us are no better off than Jonah. Some things you do not have to pray about. When God says it, you just do it. You don't have to pray about tithing. You don't have to pray about giving your money to God. You don't have to pray about going to church. You don't have to pray about praying. Amen. Listen to me. I'm talking about, friend, listen to me. These are some things tonight. God said, Jonah, get up. And you go to Nineveh. You go east. Jonah said, no, I'm going west. Are you listening to me? I believe a holy, sovereign God is so sovereign that he makes us responsible for our choices. You say explain that. Only a fool tried to explain that. Friend, I want you to know in one way Jonah had a choice. In another way, Jonah didn't have any choice. I don't have to explain that. I, but God is a sovereign God. He'll have his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And some preachers are running tonight. Some preachers don't last long in a church. You know why? They're running. They're running from themselves and they're running from God. Listen to me, friend. God's word is very clear, very vivid. We can understand. It's a frightening thing to think that we all have that ability tonight to disobey God. And I doubt seriously everybody in here is going to obey God when they hear him, when God speaks to us. And he's speaking. God's word speaking to us. And friend, I, I get to thinking about it. You say, preacher, wait a minute. I don't know if that's so. I believe we all have the power to say no. That's the same power that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. God did not instigate them sinning. He gave them instructions. They were not to live by reason. They were to live by revelation. That's the way each of us are to live. Hebrews 10, 38, the just shall live by faith. We don't have an alternative unless we want to disobey God. Amen. It's the, same, it's the same power that Moses reserved the right to have when he, when he rebelled against God at the waters of Meribeth Kadesh in the wilderness of Zen. It's the same power, friend, that Achan had when he chose to disobey God and steal God's treasure. It's the same identical power, my friend, that Saul had when he chose to disobey God and to make himself great before his people. It's the same powers, friend, that many, many preachers have had and used because God gives us that power to yield. It says in Romans 6, 16, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servant or slave you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. That power is in you tonight. God, God is not the instigator of our sinning against him and sinning against Calvary, friend. That is our power to choose. Listen, John 3, 19, men go to hell because they have rejected something. The Bible says in John 3, 19, this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light. They chose the darkness over the light. It's what the Word of God says. God have tender mercy when we get to thinking about it. God gave us that power. We all have that choice. When we think about we have the choice to live for Jesus or to reject the graces of God today. Are you listening to me? But now I understand I know you have the choice to disobey, but, uh, but, but yet God has a way of making you obey. That's amazing, isn't it? I mean, this sounds, sounds like a paradox, but it's so. You can see, but the man that sees God's face is the man that'll lose his own. And this is the whole thing we're talking about tonight. Some of us become disobedient. And let me tell you something, folks. You don't have to go out and commit adultery and get drunk to be disobedient to the Word of God. Because sin is sin. The Bible says in 1 John 3 and 4, sin is a transgression of the law. 
sin it can be pure disobedience to holy God. Let me ask you something. Are you right now doing everything you know to do in the presence of a thrice holy God, things God has spoken to your heart about, or do you keep just shoving them off on the back burner and putting them away? Huh? That's why God's called this conference, friends. He's talking to his children. He's talking to his people. God's talking to you. He's talking to me. Jonah disobeyed in spite of the certainty of the word of God, in spite of the clarity of the word of God, in spite of his own conviction hounding him every step of the way toward Joppa, every step of the way I believe God was saying, Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh. Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh. Listen, all the poet well wrote, Jonah and the great fish were dwellers in deep places, one in dark bowels of ship and great fish with wounded pride the other in a silvery belly of the sea. Both heard God say go, but only the whale did as he was told. Oh, friend, it's the tragedy of human existence to think that the animals, the mammals, the fowls, upon the very first command of God, obey the word of God. And yet we as human beings, we have that power to look in the face of a thrice holy God and Jesus even has to give us that power to say no to him. God has to give the sinner power to curse him and to deny him and rebel against him. But God has given him that power to do so. It's a wonder God hadn't done wiped us out. Oh, he has the power to do it. He has the power to do it. The path of, listen, friend, we see not only the possibility of disobedience, we see the path, path of disobedience. Look at it. It said he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship to Tarsus. He paid the fare thereof and went down into it. And he just kept on going. Listen to that. Notice that little word, down. Look at that preposition, down. Jonah went down to Joppa. He went down to the ship. He went down in the ship. He went down to the sea. He went down in the well. Friend, there's not but one direction you, that, can, that disobedience can take you tonight, and that's down. That's down. That's why I'm convinced our churches are filled with disobedience because the glory of God's not upon us. God have tender mercy down, down, down that direction. Oh, Jonah must have thought, boy, if I can just get away from this shoreline, if I can just get away from here, if this ship will just take off, where I can get away from the presence of God. Friend, you can't get away from the presence of God. Boy, if I can just get over that Bible conference, hear some good preaching, hide in the midst of it all. Well, that's the worst place in the world to come, right in the middle of an archery, uh, right in the middle of a battlefield, huh? Listen, friend, I've got news for you. It'd be a difficult thing. Oh, let me tell you, friend, sin will take you in much faster than you can get out of it. Don't you ever believe it, friend. Sin will take you in much faster. Sometimes a path of disobedience is marked by circumstances that sometimes seem convenient. I know. And you know we rationalize all the time. Well, this must be right because it fits right now. But it, I will tell you, friend, I don't care if it does fit now. If it's contrary to the Word of God, it's going to misfit down the road. You can mark that down. Huh? Oh, I'm sure Jonah walked up to that old ship master and said, I'm going to Tarsus. Have you got a ticket? Just so happens we got one. Hey, this must be right. I've got a ticket. I knew God was wrong all the time. Huh? I'm going to Tarsus. God, see, I told you, I've got a way. Mm -hmm. Some of you headed to Tarsus tonight, folk. I got news for you. Jonah never got there. I don't think you're going to ever get there. You belong to God, you're not going to get there, folk. I'm convinced with all of my heart. It seems convenient. Preacher, listen to me. The devil has to come to the will of God to get you out of the will of God. He don't mess with people that are out of the will of God. He's already got them out of the will of God. He's working on those who are in the will of God. Are you listening to me? I want you to know he's working on you now. He's reaching for you. The will of God is where the devil's going to attack you. And if you're not careful, it'll look convenient, and it get to looking so convenient, it'll make you compromise every scripture and jam them and take them out of their context to make them say what you want them to say to justify your life. There was a mighty evangelist. Everybody in here knows him. He touched a lot of hearts. Went all over the world, wrote a letter to his friends and said God told him divorce his wife. 
and marry another woman. Now, you reckon God, I, I, I hadn't found that yet. I'm still looking for it. I, I, I believe somebody's messed up. Friend, I want you to know God doesn't change his word. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I know we're in changing times and they're changing fast, but there's one thing for sure, friend. The word of God will never change. It'll never change. And God's the same in all dispensation. He doesn't fit in time zones and theological concepts and suppositions. He's God, and he won't change his word for this generation either. He won't change his word for this generation. I get so, so sometimes amazed at that bunch on television with their reasoning out and jerking people up with an IQ of about three and a half. What do you think about God? Oh, I think he's big and he's good and he lets us do whatever we want to do. Huh? I like God like that. Well, what do you think? Well, what do you think about abortion? It's my body. Huh? Yeah. What do you think about AIDS? I got it. Everybody loves me. Up Washington. Listen, I've got news for you, friend. It doesn't make any difference what we think. It's what God says that counts. We're not going to change the word of God. Oh, listen, this nation of ours is like a feist dog barking at the moon. We, I don't, we can legislate all we want to, but we'll never change this blessed, precious word of God. Thank God that, you know, pilots say that the North Star is the only fixed position in the universe. I got news to you, it's coming down one day. The only fixed position in this universe is the blessed word of God. No other fixed position but this blessed book. Oh, God have mercy. You've seen these young ladies come up to their pastors and say, well, I, I've got a new boyfriend. Well, I hadn't seen him in church. Well, he don't go to church here. Well, does he go to church? In? Well, not really. <laughs> well, God told me to marry him. Is he saved? Well, not yet. But I'm going to get him saved. No, you fixing to get in a whale. Huh? I want you to know something, folk. God hadn't changed his word for this generation. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Listen to me. If you don't believe it, ask the prodigal son. Sin, my dear friend, will take you further than you want to stray. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And sin will cost you more than you'll want to pay. Don't you ever forget it. I want you to know. You ask, ask the prodigal friend, the thing you think that will satisfy you will be the most disgusting thing in your life when God gets through with you as a child of God. Are you listening to me tonight? Oh, God said, Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. Jonah rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. You know, he found out he... He really didn't want to be out of the presence of the Lord. How do you know? It's the first thing, first one he cried for when he got out of sight of everything else. Huh? Folk, I want to tell you tonight, you don't really want to do what you're doing if you're fleeing from God tonight. You don't want to do that. Oh, I think I do. I don't think you do. You hadn't thought it through. I promise you, you think it through, you'll turn around and come on by before you get out there too far. Oh, in Jonah's choice, we see not only the possibility of disobedience or the path of disobedience, we see the price of disobedience. Notice what he says right here in this third verse. So he paid the fare thereof. Those are some strong words, folks. He paid the fare thereof, went down into it to go with them to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. He paid the fare thereof. What does it really cost to disobey God? I could take you to some suffering people tonight. Brother Jerry, your precious family over yonder is suffering tonight. Brother Jerry's nephew just blown away. I'm one just, just said, I, I, I think I'm going to kill you and just shot him. They're full of drugs. What does it cost? Really, friend, what does it cost tonight to disobey God? I'm going to tell you something. You don't want to pay the price. I promise you, you don't want to pay the price. You just think you want to experience. The devil's got a way of making it look, look good. I want you to know you don't want to do it. I promise you don't. You know what it'll do? It'll cost you loss of fellowship with God. That's the worst thing it can do. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Our biggest threat in America 
is not our economy and not even the present administration. Our biggest threat in America is God leaving us to ourselves. Withdrawing his fellowship, and I believe he's withdrawn his fellowship from a many a church. God said, I'll remove the candlestick. He said, Sardis, strengthen those things that are about to die. He said, oh, I'll have to close the door on you. He stepped outside of the Laodicean church door, friend, because he couldn't stand the smoke inside that wasn't of God. It wasn't holy smoke. Are you listening to me? My God, have mercy. No communication, no light, no love, no life. Isolating yourself in a corner. I can just see it. Can't pray. Have you ever been where you couldn't pray, you couldn't sing, you couldn't function? Oh, get down. You're out. Fellowship, loss of fellowship of God, friend, is the most awesome experience any child of God can have. It's an awful experience. To have to live like that, the most miserable people in this world are those Christians who are running from God, trying to hide their sin, living in the no-darkness zone. Oh, God, have mercy. No fellowship with God. Evangelists and preachers, there are those committing adultery tonight and mounting the pulpit. But friend, the glory of God's not on them. The power of God's not there. No fellowship with holy God. Not only the loss of fellowship with God, it'll be the loss of the fulfillment of life. Every prophecy that Jonah made was fulfilled, friend. But you see, instead of fulfillment, he was the most despondent evangelist we've ever read about in this book. Are you listening to me? He was a despondent evangelist. And the one cardinal sin problem I believe in our Baptist churches today is the sin of disobedience. Disobedience. God's going to call on you to obey him this week. Are you ready to obey him? Listen to me. Not only the loss of fellowship, fulfillment of joy, but the loss of the fruitfulness of the harvest. I wonder how many souls died and went to hell between Jonah's hearing God jumping up and going toward Tarsus before he ever got to Nineveh. Are you listening to me, friend? Oh, where did Jonah want to go? He wanted to go to Tarsus. Did he ever get there? Did he? You answer it. You reckon you're going to ever get there? I think I'd just throw up my handkerchief tonight and holler surrender before I, before I left. Listen to me. I think I'd do it, folks. We must remember the one rule as a Christian in life. One step out of the will of God is just as dangerous as stepping off of a cliff. Don't you ever forget it. There's some folk here tonight maybe thinking about it. Maybe some of you are done down the trail headed toward the ship. But I want you to know it's going to show up, folks. We never see a man falling. We only see him when he hits. We would be sitting here tonight enjoying the Word of God saying amen, but I want you to know it'll show up when you hit, friend. Oh, there are preachers who mounted the pulpit preached with unconfessed sin, but it finally came out. God has so designed sin, we can't hide it. We're not going to hide sin, friend. The price of stepping out of the will of God, I promise you, you don't want to pay it. I could take you to some broken-hearted saints tonight. My God. I remember one of Leonard Ravenhill's books. He wrote these words at Joppa, Jonah slipped the price of that ticket over the counter to the book and clerk. But no book and clerk or even the rebelist revival himself knew the real price of that ticket. The souls of men, the anguish of the fish, are the first submarine journey in a nightmarish experience on a foam blubber mattress and a whale's belly. The judgment day alone will reveal the total fallacy, backsliding, and the wretched cost of evading the will of God. Jonah paid the fare of pain, privation, peril, finally prison in the depth of the sea. He cut himself off from God and himself and from men. He was useless to God and to man. My God, the worst place on earth is a man of God out of the will of God in limbo. I sat at the breakfast table some time back with a preacher 95% of this congregation would know 
He began to talk to me as he wept. He said, Preacher, he had violated God. At least I had respect for him. He stepped out of the ministry. And he'd violated God and sitting at the breakfast table with tears in his eyes. He said, Preacher, the worst moments I have is when I first get up in the morning, if I could just cut my throat in the shower and let the blood drain from my body. He said, I'm dying. I'm dying to think I could never preach with the glory of God on me anymore. Oh, listen to me, friend. He said, Preacher, I know God's going to run me down. He said, When you hear about me dying, I want you to come and preach my funeral. He said, If you don't get up and tell them it was a backslidden Baptist preacher running from God, I'll come back and haunt you to your grave. I said, Brother, if they call me God being my witness, I'll stand and tell them a backslidden man of God was running from Jesus. Oh, my God, friend. You don't want to pay the price. You don't want to pay it. Are you listening to me? Disobedience is a sin of our day. I close with this. I heard the story about a man and his father and his dad was sitting by an old fireplace enjoying the evening. Dad said, son, get up and put a log on the fire. He said, not right now. Dad said, son, I said, get up and put a log on the fire. He said, well, I don't want to do it right now, Dad. He said, son, let me tell you something. I've supported you all of your life. You're big enough now to support yourself. He said, I'm not asking you to get up and put a log on the fire. I'm telling you to get up and put a log on the fire. He said, well, if that's the way you feel about it, I'll just pack my stuff and leave. And he did. About three days later, he got to thinking about what he did. He said, you know, I'm a fool. My old daddy's been good to me. Why did I do such an ignorant thing? He got his stuff together, went back over to his dad. He said, Dad, I want you to know I've been a fool. He said, listen, I want you to forgive me. Can I come back home? He said, son. Take your stuff and put it back there in the back room in your room. He said, I'm so glad you're home. I love you. By the way, when you pass that log, pal, pick up that log and go put it on the fire. I want to tell you, my friend, listen to me tonight. Boys and girls, men and women, no amount of tears, no amount of repentance, no amount of Cryings and weepings will take the place of your obedience to the Word of God. Let us pray. Our Father, we want to praise you. We want to thank you, Lord, for letting us come this far by faith. Oh, Lord Jesus. We know there are hungry, desperate people on these grounds this week. We've talked to some. They need to hear from you, Lord. God, I'm convinced that's not going to be the problem. They need to be obedient to the Word of God. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us to guard the Word of God as we hear it with our lives. Because, dear God, I believe it's a dangerous thing to be under the Word of God. But Lord, it's dangerous to just have a copy of your Word and not even read it and obey it. We'll be responsible for it. Bless, dear God, these precious saints of God and use the Word of God as Brother Ron comes in a few moments to keep us directed toward the glory. Do what's necessary for us to see it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.